This video is sponsored by Let's Get Checked. For private at-home STI testing, check out the link in the description below. Chlamydia. We've all heard of it. But did you know chlamydia is the most common cause of bacterial sexually transmitted infection in both males and females? And with that little piece of information, we've got some important questions to answer. Like, what specific parts of the body could this affect? How do you get it? And how do you treat it? Also, can you get chlamydia more than once and will that affect future treatments? And lastly, can you get chlamydia and not even know it? These are important questions we need to answer, so let's do this. So as we start this discussion about chlamydia, I do want to mention our video quiz question of the day. And that is, what is another sexually transmitted infection caused by a virus that can cause painful blistering lesions of the genital structures? Now, if you want to be a hero, you can also mention the other form or type that typically causes painful blistering lesions on the mouth or the lips. Go ahead and post those answers in the comments below, and we'll pin the correct answer at the top of the comment section. But let's get into this discussion about chlamydia. In the intro, I mentioned chlamydia was caused by a bacterium, specifically called chlamydia trachomatis. Now, chlamydia most often affects urinary and genital system structures. So let's take a look at this cadaver dissection. You can see a midline cut or through the sagittal plane like so, and we're gonna take a look at the right side of the pelvic cavity. The most commonly infected structure in females is right here called the cervix of the uterus. And you can see the cervix connected to the vaginal canal here. Now, another commonly infected site in females is the urethra. The urethra is that tube that drains urine from the bladder and into the toilet, hopefully. Now, the urethra is also the most commonly infected site in males. Now, in both males and females, that bacteria or that infection can actually move up or ascend to other structures in some cases. And in the case of males, if we take a look at this cadaver dissection, we've got a right testis. This curved structure called the epididymis, where sperm cells are stored, the chlamydia trachomatis can make it into the epididymis and infect it. Now, in females, the ascending infection can move from the cervix of the uterus into the main portion of the uterus here, into the uterine tube, and even into the ovary. Now, keep in mind the uterine tube, there's another name that people often refer to it as the fallopian tube, but uterine tube, fallopian tube, same thing. Now, when we're talking about these urinary and genital system structures, they're all potential sites for infection. Keep in mind the urethra and the cervix are the most common, but all of these sites could potentially become inflamed. Now, when we talk about inflammation, we usually tack on the phrase itis. So like inflammation of the urethra would be urethritis. We've got epididymitis, cervicitis for inflammation of the cervix. But the reason I'm bringing this up, because in the case of the ascending infection in females, where the main portion of the uterus can get inflamed, the uterine tube, and even the ovary, there's a term for this called pelvic inflammatory disease, or PID. And this is important to understand when chlamydia causes this infection or this inflammation. Because with PID, there are associated risk factors, things like infertility and ectopic pregnancies. Now, one of the main reasons why there's an increased risk of ectopic pregnancy and infertility from PID caused by chlamydia is that within the uterine tube that we saw here is that there can be a buildup of scar tissue due to that inflammation. Now think of that scar tissue building up and narrowing the inside of the tube. That's gonna make it more difficult for sperm cells to pass by to actually fertilize an egg. And even if sperm cells do make it by and fertilize that egg, that scar tissue that it's gonna to have to pass by in order to implant into the uterus where it's supposed to often that fertilized egg will get stuck in the scar tissue and implant there, causing that ectopic pregnancy, which again is a serious situation and we always wanna get those taken care of. But we've talked about all these different structures that can be affected by a chlamydial infection. But what are potential signs and symptoms that a person might experience, if any? Now, the reason I said, if any, is because the majority of people who contract chlamydia don't have any symptoms, or they're asymptomatic. That answers our question from the beginning of the video, meaning that you can have chlamydia and not have a clue that you have it. That means we could be spreading this thing around and not even knowing it. Now granted, that's going to be more likely if you're participating in risky sexual behaviors, and more on risk and reducing the risk of spread a little bit later, but let's do talk about some of the patients or people that do actually get symptoms. Now, in the case of cervicitis or inflammation of the cervix, 
Those symptoms can be abnormal vaginal discharge, even intermenstrual bleeding, so bleeding between periods, and even postcoital bleeding or bleeding after sex. Now, often females will also have the urethra affected at the same time, and that can have things like frequency, meaning that you feel like you have to pee more frequently, and dysuria, which is a fancy pants name for painful urination or burning sensation during urination or peeing. Now, males will also get those similar symptoms with the urethra and frequency and dysuria, but they can also get an abnormal urethral discharge. It's kind of a watery mucoid discharge that sometimes they'll just notice in their underwear. Now, when we're talking about these different locations, we also have to talk about the potential for ascending infection. So in the case of males, if it gets to the epididymis, they can have unilateral testicular pain and even tenderness and swelling of the epididymis. If we're talking about pelvic inflammatory disease, we can add things like abdominal pain and pelvic pain to the list, as well as sometimes they can get fever and chills. Now, none of these symptoms that we've talked about are just specific to chlamydia, meaning there are other pathogens or other infections that can cause similar symptoms. Things like bacterial vaginosis or a vaginal yeast infection can cause abnormal vaginal discharge or vaginal bleeding. Basic UTIs can cause dysuria and frequency in females and males. Epididymitis in males can be caused by other bacterial infections besides just chlamydia. So that's why it's important to do an accurate risk assessment of each individual to see what their risk is of getting a chlamydia infection, as well as accurate testing. And when it comes to testing for chlamydia, the current best test is called the Nucleic Acid Amplification Test, or NAAT. This is a molecular test that essentially detects the genetic information of the pathogen. And you can gather the specimen by either swabbing the potentially infected site or through a urine sample. Now, when I'm testing patients for chlamydia in the clinic, I will also test them for gonorrhea. And the reason for that is there are plenty of cases where people will have both chlamydia and gonorrhea infections at the same time. And that's because they spread in a very similar fashion and tend to infect similar structures. Now, this discussion on testing is quite convenient because the sponsor of today's video is Let's Get Checked. Let's Get Checked provides convenient and private testing in the comfort of your own home. They have all sorts of tests from routine blood work to hormone tests, and yes, obviously tests for sexually transmitted infections, and they use that nucleic acid amplification test. If you wanted to get tested, all you have to do is get online, pick the test you want, and they will ship that test to your house where you can gather the specimen and ship it back with their prepaid label. They also even have medical staff on hand that can talk about any positive test results and even potential treatment options. And I think we can agree that testing is important. It helps confirm the diagnosis and infection, as well as helps guide potential treatment options. It can also help to reduce the risk of spread, because if one were to test positive for chlamydia, it would probably be wise for that person to refrain from sexual activity until they underwent a full treatment course. It would also be wise to notify recent sexual partners so those partners could also get tested, potentially treated, and also refrain from sexual activity as well. If you're interested in getting tested and maybe even getting a test for your special friend, go to trylgc.com slash IHASTI and they'll give you 30% off any of their tests if you use our coupon code IHA30. The link is in the description below. But I do need to mention some other places that are non-urinary or non-genital locations where chlamydia has been isolated or found to infect. And one of those places is the rectum here that you can see. Now, like the other cases, when it's in the rectum, it's often asymptomatic, but when it does have symptoms, we can have things like rectal bleeding, anal rectal pain, discharge, and some people have even reported things like constipation. Another site is the eye, specifically the conjunctiva or that outer transparent covering of the eye, which means it can cause a form of conjunctivitis, which many of us refer to as pink eye. Now don't freak out, the majority of cases of pink eye are still viral and caused by other bacterial infections, but chlamydia can cause a form of conjunctivitis. Now it's also been isolated in the pharynx, which is a fancy pants name for the word throat, but most of the time we see that chlamydia isn't a major cause of pharyngitis or inflammation of those throat structures, but again, it has been isolated in that location. Now, I'm sure many of you are reverting back to your teenage minds and thinking, how does it get to those places? It's pretty straightforward, right? I mean, we've got to get genital secretions from an infected individual in contact with those other structures. And voila, chlamydia can spread. 
Now, let me mention one thing about conjunctivitis. A lot of the conjunctivitis cases are actually from newborn babies, and that happens from passing through the birth canal if their mother is infected with chlamydia. Maybe she didn't know, or didn't have access to testing. But that's also why during prenatal care or during pregnancy, females will often go through testing for chlamydia and other genital infections to ensure that nothing gets passed on to the baby. So how do you treat chlamydia? Chlamydia is treated with antibiotics. And keep in mind, when you treat for chlamydia, protocol is also to treat for gonorrhea. If you remember, there are plenty of cases that people can have chlamydia and gonorrhea at the same time. Now there's two main antibiotics that we use for chlamydia, and that is doxycycline or azithromycin. Now doxycycline has been shown to be a little bit more effective than azithromycin, so right now that is the first line treatment or the treatment of choice. The Problem is there's some pros and cons when you compare the two. The con of doxycycline is you have to take it twice a day for seven days, whereas azithromycin you only have to take one gram once. And so when we're talking about effectiveness, yes doxycycline is more effective, but in certain situations, if I have a patient who may have trouble complying to the antibiotics for whatever their lifestyle situation is, and I'm afraid they might not be able to actually take the doxycycline consistently for seven days straight, I may still give them that one-time dose of azithromycin in the clinic. Now, one really cool thing about chlamydia, or I should probably say interesting thing about chlamydia that relates to treatment is its replication cycle. This thing has a unique replication cycle, two main phases. And it is classified as a bacterial infection, but in some ways it kind of behaves like a virus. Chlamydia is actually referred to as an obligate intracellular parasite or pathogen, meaning it needs to get inside of our cells in order for it to replicate. Now its first form is referred to as the elementary body, and this can live outside of our cells. It's very resistant to any type of killing, so it doesn't really get killed by antibiotics in this form. But this form is all about getting inside the cell because it is metabolically inactive at this point. So once it gets pulled into our cells, either through phagocytosis or endocytosis, it ends up in this little vesicle or sac-like structure inside the cell. And then it converts into the reticulate body. The reticulate body is the form that's metabolically active and starts to replicate and divide like crazy through binary fission. And it uses our cells, resources, and machinery to do this. And this is the phase that it's susceptible. So the antibiotics that we choose have to be able to get into the cell to kill it in the reticulate body phase and also have a long enough half-life or last long enough in our system to actually get in during this phase because it takes a few days while it's replicating inside the cell. Then those reticulate bodies will convert back to the elementary bodies and then the cell ruptures and those elementary bodies can then infect more cells throughout our body. So once we've successfully treated a chlamydia infection, let's answer our final question of once you've been treated, can you get the infection again? And you've probably got that answer rolling through your mind, but let me illustrate this with a patient case. A few months ago, a patient came into the clinic for STI testing. And so I go in there, we're having this discussion, I'm getting the full history, and the patient says to me, I'm pretty sure I've got chlamydia and or gonorrhea. And I said, well, why do you think that? And the patient says, well, I've had either one of these infections over 10 times, and this feels the same. Now in medicine, you get really good at developing your poker face. In all seriousness, it's really important to maintain this neutral, caring, non-judgmental vibe with your patients because you need them to feel comfortable to give you accurate information so you can accurately diagnose, order the right tests, and treat. And so I'm maintaining this vibe with the patient, and but in my head I'm thinking, no way, it hasn't been 10 times. So I order the new test, but while I'm looking and ordering that test, I can see the previous test and the previous test results. And this patient was not exaggerating over 10 times. Now, that answers our question. You definitely can get chlamydia and gonorrhea again once you successfully treated it. And there's this important discussion around antibiotic resistance. Now to be fair, chlamydia doesn't tend to develop a lot of antibiotic resistance, at least not so far, and that's thought to be because of that unique replication cycle we talked about, doesn't lend itself to developing resistance. But gonorrhea, that's a different game there. Gonorrhea is definitely developing resistant strains to the point where we've had to up the dosage of the medication in order to treat it. And so this brings us to this discussion of safe sex practices. We want to promote these things, things like barrier methods, knowing your partners if you can, as well as things like appropriate testing. Now, all of us have made 
less than ideal choices throughout life, and including less than ideal sexual choices, and may have contracted a sexually transmitted infection. Or maybe you were even, somebody was even dishonest with you and you contracted an infection that way. And so we definitely need to be able to treat these infections for various scenarios and reasons. But 10 times, I feel like at that point we can say, you're being a little irresponsible. As always, thank you for watching our crazy anatomical videos. It really does help support the channel. If you feel like getting any of those tests, be sure to check out that link for Let's Get Checked below and they'll give you 30% off to a variety of different tests. Jeffrey does want me to let you know that he would be smiling at all of you if he actually had a zygomaticus major and minor muscle, but he doesn't. So he says that he'll settle for you using some of your limb muscles to possibly click the like and subscribe button. And we'll see you in the next video.